Welcome to the DNA of Purpose podcast. It is such a joy to have you beaming into the studio, Dr. Layla Ajaralu. Hi. Hi. I hope I got the pronunciation you right. Did, did I nailed it the first time. I'm like, <laughs> did I get it the second time? I am not sure. You did, you did, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Layla, as, as I was saying prior to hitting record, I have so many questions to ask you today, but I'm actually going to kick off with a question within a question. Now I get to, uh, you know, speak to a lot of incredible minds on the podcast, just like yourself. And I'm always curious to understand what questions are these people asking themselves? And so what I'd love to know as a starting point is what question is currently guiding your life or guiding your work forward at this, this exact moment in time? It's a good question. Um, I would say, well, there's a few things. Um, professionally, I'm always very curious about transformation and how that unfolds. I get to work with lots of different stakeholders, whether it be CEOs of major companies um, through to governments. Uh, and in my experience, I, I get a lot of um, uh, insights and nuances into what change and transformation is like at different stages. So I'm always questioning that. And actually that kind of bleeds over into my own personal life. I think if you work in change, you can can't help but constantly be questioning questioning how change affects you and when you are willing to change and when you're willing when you're more resistant to it right and I think that that's certainly something in my personal life that's guiding me at the moment is questioning like what are the things that are serving me um, that are helping me be more efficient effective centered um, grounded as a person that then uh, supports me in being a more effective change maker so it's kind of like a bit meta and a bit interconnected so my experience has been counting other people's resistance to change kind of helps me focus or reflect back on my own. Um, and so that helps me uh, question and perhaps then explore and experiment with different ways of living and, and different activities that will help me be a more centered and grounded person in my work. Oh, I love that. And what a perfect question for someone who in having spent uh, much of yesterday morning immersed in your work is not only a provocateur of change, particularly in the sustainability space, but somebody who, in my view, decodes the road forward for people in such an elegant way. I was elegant, doing elegant is work. not a word that I usually get described <laughs> as but I'll take it I will take well, elegant <laughs> uh, look I and I will give it to you because you know when we're talking about what is essentially a paradigm shift in terms of the circular economy it can feel incredibly overwhelming for people and having sat through your LinkedIn e-learning course yesterday which I have to say I didn't mean to do that but I went right down the rabbit hole I think you really gracefully break down complexity and make it digestible for everyday humans such as and myself. I hope, so. I hope that you also laughed a lot at that one because I really amped up the props as much as I could. I loved the props. <laughs> I loved the props and they absolutely worked. I have seared into my mind at the moment the difference between the weight of the natural world versus <laughs> uh, versus the man-made world, which was a kettle, I believe, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, moving on, because we do have a lot to get through to kind of capture some of this gold. Um, there's so much to talk about today, but I really want to get inside who you are and understand a little more <clears throat> about your personal story. Looking at your background as an award-winning designer, sustainability provocateur, and social scientist, I'm curious to know, was the desire to you know, quote unquote, disrupt the status quo uh, and to become an advocate for the planet, always an inherent part of, of who you were uh, as a child growing up, or was there like a define, defining moment or point in time where your purpose and your work today became crystal clear? Yeah, absolutely. There was like a very clear moment where the trajectory of my life absolutely careered off into this space. Um, I think as a kid, I was definitely very into animals and welfare and, and human rights. And I was, you know, volunteering as a young person with, with Amnesty's Refugee Committee in Australia when we had all of the first round of crises in that space. So I think I've always been a very um, passionate person about like what I think is right. And I've been vegetarian my whole life and all this kind of stuff. But as far as like 
learning about the planet and my role within it. That was, I learned nothing as a child, like not my schooling, nor my family, nor anyone else told me that I am a biological being interconnected with all of the natural systems around me and that it is in the imperative of my existence that I support the sustenance of the systems around me so that I can thrive but also so that we can you know live um live uh, in a beautiful future right like none mm. of that was ever told to me in any way shape or form um, and I was in my, um, I think I was in my second year of design studies and one of our, uh, delightful, quite old, uh, professors who was an engineer kind of did this, like got open the tech, literally a textbook that was really fat and just kind of said, you know, opens page 56. We're going to learn about this thing called the Gaia theory, which is that everything in nature is interconnected. You're going to make decisions. They're going to have far reaching impacts on the planet, you know, some bad, some good. So you probably should learn about it anyway, like closes the book pushes it aside, moves on. And I'm sitting there, my, <laughs> literally my brain has just gone, like it just exploded. I was like, oh my gosh, Whoa. everything just said makes so much sense. Why the hell did I not know this? And so I kind of turned to the rest of the class, which was like predominantly boys at that. And it's quite common in industrial design. And, um, and I remember saying, like, I have this etched into my head. Um, oh my gosh, guys, what are we going to do about this? um and like probably a lot of profanity as well and then this dude sitting next to me was like I don't know why you're freaking out Layla it's not like any of these catastrophic environmental impacts will affect us in our lifetime so why should we care and that statement why should we care was so profound because I suddenly had this like caring like massive opening of like a fusion of, of reality and here's other people just completely not responding to that and that that juxtaposition I think was the thing that seared into my my mind as a massive problem and opportunity that we need to figure out how to work through. And so like after that class, I like traipsed myself off to the library and went looking for any books I could on like this new topic that I just uncovered, like nature <laughs> and the world around me. And, uh, you know, it was definitely the days where books were the the primary force, source of in, um, incoming information. And yeah, I found a couple. One was Victor Papadik, who's like one of the kind of one of the forefathers of sustainability and design. And also, um, I'm pretty sure it was the Canadian author, um, oh, I forgot his name right now. Well, another book, I think it was Natural Capital. I can't remember exactly, but I certainly remember crying in the next class when I read this page all about the relationship between the bears, the salmon and the forest. And like, which is an indigenous, um, Canadian indigenous uh, knowledge system about the mm. relationship and the interconnected relationship between these elements of the system. And I remember sitting there and looking out the window and looking at like the trees and look, reading this book and being like, oh my God, everything's interconnected. <laughs> 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 Truly having like an existential crisis yeah. about what I didn't know. And now what I am knowing and the, the rightness of these words and these ideas, like it sunk into my being like so quickly. And I was like, oh, this just really makes a lot of sense. But then I had this huge problem because I'm now learning how to basically form plastic and products and make, you know, people buy stuff. And I've suddenly got this like huge awakening and awareness about the potential impacts of those decisions. And I felt very ill-equipped to make those decisions based on what I was learning. So it kind of really did start a bit of an existential crisis. I ended up quitting design school and then found my way through to uh, social science majoring in sustainability, which I'm so grateful for because my brain and social science were like match made in heaven. Mm. And I didn't realize um, that I was really smart <laughs> Truly, <laughs> because I hadn't done very well at school. Because yeah. uh, then when I went to study social science, I like ducks my university because everything to me was just like... <sighs> And I got it all and it was also exciting and interesting. And I just, the learning process suddenly became this joyous experience. Um, and then I went on to do my PhD combining social science and uh, design. I did it in industrial design and, and I actually did it in how to make change through design. And so it kind of had a bit of a, a full circle experience with my, mm. my career in that sense. Oh, there's so many beautiful golden threads in in what you just shared. Like, of course, it makes sense that you did social science and sustainability when you look at this focus on interconnectivity. Uh, and, you know, what what you just said, what, when you learned that, that that completely blew your mind. And I'm going down that rabbit hole at the moment with uh, Right Story, Wrong Story, which is a book by uh, yeah. Dr. Tyson Junkerporter. So I'm like right there with you. I'm like, oh, my God, I never knew that. 
and it's completely well, flipping my mind as well we have such a, a, a tragic knowledge gap where yeah. we have not as white Australians been exposed to the incredible knowledge, wisdom, and rightness of Indigenous worldviews and First Nations mm. knowledge systems. And it's something that obviously we have a lot of work to do to rectify, and Tyson is, is really doing an incredible job in that space. Um, but globally, we have such a, a, a loss of potential um, solutions, but also the wisdom that, that non-Eurocentric worldviews offer and that is all over the world where we haven't had colonization, but also where there was colonization and the communities were intentionally repressed and their knowledge was essentially, you know, eradicated, but has mm. still managed to, um, what's the word, like thrive in certain pockets. And so for me personally, that's like a current learning journey I'm going on. Everything that I now know in sustainability and systems and circularity, I believe is embedded in First Nations knowledge principles. But too much of the Western world with our academic systems only prioritizes those that get put their name on papers in a journal or get published, which is very hard for a lot of people. So we've we've essentially, what's the word, like weeded out a lot of knowledge and um, uh, <clears throat> wisdom that would be so profoundly um, useful in this moment in time in addressing climate change and addressing biodiversity loss and addressing social equality and the fusions that we have within ourselves in relation to nature. And uh, it's just, it's such a wealth and it's such a tragedy that we still really prioritize only Western um, worldview. And, and there's a big movement mm -hmm. right now in the design world called decolonizing design, which is really about um, taking the accountability to question the colonized ideologies that have per perpetuated the current kind of fields that we work within. And that requires a lot of um, um, presence and patience and, and openness and, and leaning into the discomfort of not knowing and questioning some of the things you do know. And I think Tyson's work has really helped to, Tyson and a number of other authors have helped mm. to push us to, to think differently and, and, and respect and acknowledge that, that perhaps the wisdom that we need to solve the problems are actually uh, not, too, not too distant from us. Mm, fascinating. So I, I want to paint the picture in, uh, in relation to the climate crisis. I mm. recently read a quote uh, by a person called Dan Sullivan that says, all progress starts with the truth. And so what I'm wondering is what is the truth that we need to collectively confront? And from a behavioural change perspective, what is the best way to work with that truth in order to ignite human progress, ecological restoration, to ensure ecological restoration uh, and environmental stewardship? Hmm. So your question is about the human side of that? Well, it's it's a twofold question. It's like, mm -hmm. what is the state of play? What what is the problem? Like, what is the truth? And once we uh, are able to recognize that, you know, we know that people don't necessarily respond to fear. So, how do we actually go about leaning in and enabling the change that we need to see in the world to to deal with this problem? Truth. Uh, so I can speak to what I know, and what I know is that. Uh, over the last 75 years specifically, so post Second World War, we have systematically eroded the natural world through consumerism. And we have created an economy that is inherently addicted to exploitation, extraction and disposability. And those systems are essentially eroding the entire um, uh, system of sustaining the, the only known life-sustaining planet on the universe, which is ours, planet Earth, and that we are, as humans, directly responsible for that. Of course, the decisions made of the past are not the literal accountability of those that exist today, but for sure we are responsible for uh, learning from the past to make better pathways to the future. And so the, the current state of affairs when it comes to the natural world is that we have exploited the natural um, ecosystems, whether it be through extracting minerals, uh, petrochemicals, or um, 
nature-based materials from you know the, the ocean or from the land and we've done that at such an extent that we have um, created an imbalance a significant imbalance because nature is always about homeostasis like our body it's trying to always find a sense of balance and over time it does that by adapting to the changing system so when we've had ice ages or now we're going into a climate fuel phase nature will adapt but the human form is very difficult and uh, very resistant, I should say, to adapting to change. And so what happens is we, as a, as a product of our uh, social experience and perhaps our neuroscience, we're very, um, cons we consistently want to maintain the status quo and, and we like to stay um, in a comfort zone, like what we're used to. And so ultimately, as the world changes around us, as it is, as we know it is, and especially in regards to the obvious effects of climate change, which I think is hilariously ironic that for the last 25 years every climate scientist has been like here's the predictions and we're now living in the predictions and people are like you really whoa <laughs> like all the scientists Funny are like that. god, god. <laughs> the scientists so, were right oh so, so, most of the time the scientists <laughs> are right anyway so yeah ultimately um this kind of disconnect that we have like in the modern human right this kind of Eurocentric or Western world um, human are very disconnected from the natural world. And that disconnection makes it very easy for us to ignore the impacts of our actions and to rely on nature in a really um, unequal way. So most people listening to this podcast, I would say, have not grown their own food. They don't know how complex it is and the inputs, the outputs, the time that it takes to grow one broccoli, for example. We mm. go to a supermarket, we hand over money that we earned trading our skills on the marketplace, and we expect those products to be available and healthy and consistently there and we don't question the impacts of the choices we make whether we're buying a steak or a piece of broccoli um and if that then gets you know goes rotten in your fridge and you throw it out and then have to go buy something new we don't have any kind of real understanding of the relationship between those impacts and that then makes it very easy for us as the modern human to go about our lives causing unintended consequences and so one of the big goals of sustainability is to actually provide the knowledge and insights about the cause and effect relationships of actions, both individually and collectively, um, whether that be businesses or governments or even just particular communities, so that we mm. can then make choices around how we grow food, around how we live our lives, around how we design products and services that then ultimately change the course of the future through the choices that we make today. And so the state of play with regards to nature is it is stressed. We have placed an insurmountable um, amount, <laughs> insurmountable amount, which sounds like a doxymoron. It works. Of pressure on the natural world in both our extraction and our input. So air pollution, toxicity, and also um, waste. And so in that system, that linear system of extraction, making, and then waste, we have ultimately um, eroded the life support systems in multiple ways. And that's what's evident through this really interesting um, scientific work out of the Stockholm Resilience Center called the Planetary Boundaries, which I highly recommend your listeners Google, and you'll see that we've exceeded several of the nine planetary boundaries and then there's a, some work out of Oxford University by economist Kate Raworth, who has taken that concept and created something called the donut economic model, which is the idea that we can not fall off the edge of the outside of the donut, creating an unsustainable future. And we're not going to fall into the middle where um, it's, it's so constrained that a lot of people don't get their needs met. And so we can find a way of creating a healthy, thriving economy um, that works within the known parameters of this one life-sustaining earth that we all share. So there's a lot going on and there's a lot of space for people to learn and engage. And the one thing I would say is that I think historically sustainability or anything to do with the environment has been seen as being an opt-in, hippie, nice to have, sideline. But right now, globally, the transition to a circular and sustainable and even regenerative economy is being embedded in governments. It is being, it is no longer um, something that one kind of person within a a massive company will do at lunchtime. It's actually becoming one of the fastest growing uh, requirements in the skill set. There's a really interesting piece of work that comes out every year from LinkedIn called the Green Skills Gap, which looks at the difference between people's um, stated skills on their LinkedIn profiles and the required job skills. 
in relation to sustainability and we have a huge gap there so we don't have universities teaching people how to do this adequately and individuals within their workplace uh, like most people you speak to know that there's a climate crisis and are probably pretty anxious about it and yet they go to do their jobs and they're given no space to consider what it is in their job that could actually be done to help address the climate crisis or any of the other environmental and social issues. So that's actually one of the big things that I've been working on recently is creating tools that support that transition within the workplace. We have an online training platform called Swivel Skills. And that's something that I'm very deeply passionate about because I don't want people to quit their jobs if they're woken up to this and then go and work for like a not-for-profit in sustainability because I need people in their jobs changing their skills so that they can help change those companies because that is really the only way we're going to address sustainability is when corporations and companies change their practices. Mm. And I mean, your work is is incredible in the sense that I've been in the space of purpose-driven business for probably about seven or eight years now. And, you know, even maybe only five years ago, um, it's, you know, the circular economy and donut economics seem like a great idea, but, you know, to the naysayers out there, maybe also seemed a little bit far-fetched in the context of our, you know, capitalist world. But today it really feels like there is genuine momentum building and that this new paradigm is now becoming a possible reality. For our listeners out there who might be unfamiliar with donut economics or the circular economy, could you explain the difference between capitalism and this new economic model uh, that is really crucial in the battle against climate? Okay, I'll start with the circular economy. So essentially, yep. this is a a subset of sustainability. Sustainability is about social, economic, and environmental impacts. It's about understanding the um, outcome of our actions, both good and bad, and then rectifying or making choices to um, minimize and hopefully transform those impacts so that we are actually working within the, the means of the planet. And we're doing that in a socially equitable way and an economically viable way. Mm. And so there's multiple subsets within that or like under the big umbrella. And um, the circular economy is definitely a huge part of that. And that is essentially a way of reorientating our current economic model, which is based on, as we, we said, ex ex extraction and exploitation, which is called the linear system where we take make waste. So we take from nature, we make goods and services, and then we waste them. That linear model is inherently unsustainable. And so the circular economy is about closing the loop on that and transforming the way we do business and design products and services so that we have human needs met, but in these sustainable and regenerative ways. And there are three key principles um, that are commonly shared around the circular economy. The first is to eliminate waste. So we design systems that make waste obsolete. As it stands right now, um, most products are designed to be wasted. And so we have to redesign our business models so that companies kind of own the product across its whole life. And perhaps they lease you the service or they have a different relationship with you and the product. <clears throat> Certainly. So for example, we would eliminate single use products through different systems of reusability that are very frictionless and convenient for people to use. When you're getting your coffee cup, it can be a checkout reusable one, but then you have these receptacles instead of trash cans that you put in all these kinds of systems based solutions. So that's the first, eliminate waste. The next one is to uh, make things last longer. So every time we throw something out, we have to go to nature to replace that. And so we're, we're extracting natural resources at a rate that is unsustainable. And so when you make things last longer by repairing them, um, remanufacturing, uh, encouraging sharing and leasing systems, then we're eliminating that pressure on nature, but we're also then making sure that the goods that exist uh, are basically being utilized to their max maximum utility or capacity. And then that does require us to redesign products so that they are repairable and so that they are actually durable. And then the last one is to restore and regenerate nature, which is essentially very important because we always go to nature to take resources. Everything that exists has come from nature and will return. And so we want to then create practices of restoration and regeneration. So a mine site, once we've extracted the resources, the plan of, of designing that site and that extraction process to have the lowest footprint, but then also have the maximum restoration, for example. And then also by default of doing the first two, we naturally allow for nature to be, um, I would even say like uh, not disrupted because even right now as we're, we're racing to solve the climate crisis, there's this huge issue of what's called green colonization, where in the race to create 
batteries and electrification, the resources required to do that are often in pristine Indigenous lands. Mm. And so we've got a lot of companies going to exploit these resources in very unsustainable ways under the guise of solving the climate crisis. So, you know, part of the problem is, is we're using the same thinking, the same ideology and mindset to solve the problems caused by that thinking. And that's really one of the big disruptions that we need right now is we need to transform the way we understand the problem so that the solutions we put in place do not become the future problems. And that's really where things like systems thinking come in that help us understand the nuances and relationships and the social conditions that feed into the problems to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the key thing here is the circular economy is about changing the way we do business. So it's not just about how we design products and services, it's actually about how we organize society and how businesses meet people's needs and gain economic value for, through that and the cool thing is is it's not just some pie in the sky idea like you said it's literally mm. in laws all over the world so australia has actually committed to a circular economy and i've been working to help advance that with the federal government we also have the european union have very robust circular economy um and sustainability rules that will affect not just companies that work and exist within the EU, it'll actually affect companies that sell any goods or services into the European Union. You have parts of Asia with circular economy policies. So we're seeing this transformation unfold where the reality of our resource constraints and the um, significant environmental and social impacts of waste generation and the fact that countries are running out of landfill space, right? Like there's just mm. some really hard realities that are forcing governments to actually take action but also consumers are demanding more sustainable products. And they, there's even a huge movement called Zero Waste, which has been growing for the last decade. If you go on Instagram, you'll see so many people who are living particular lifestyles that are really about eliminating waste. And so most major cities now will have uh, shops where you can go and you can bulk buy using your own containers. Like this is a reality that's unfolding. And so companies are, are responding to those needs as well as the regulatory pressures. So there's a lot going on. It's extremely exciting. I think we're at the forefront of a massive transformation in the way we um, we organize society. And so I encourage your listeners to think about how you can be a part of this. It's not rocket science. You do require some technical skills, but all of that can be, if you've already got a bunch of skills, it's not going to be hard for you to learn the basics and then apply it to what you already know so that you can contribute. And on a personal level, every action that we take in the economy has impacts, right? So we can help make this transformation move faster by choosing to buy different goods and services, because that is then the data that companies use to determine what they'll then create in the mm. future. And so that's all the circular economy. And then as far as donut economics goes, well, I mean, I'm not Kate. Kate explains it the best. <laughs> um, her idea is fantastic because she it's basically- It's a good book. Yeah. It, yeah. And also she she's yeah. a lot of stuff online and, and, you know, Melbourne and Sydney, if you're listening in Australia, both have regenerate, uh, so, um, sorry, donut economic um, models that are being developed and that you can go online and you can see essentially the cities map their- impact across those nine planetary boundaries that I mentioned, and then start to develop strategies for how we can live within this safe operating space um, uh, within the, the donut, basically. So it's a really cool concept. And I think from the city level, it's a really important idea. I would say the circular economy operates more at the business and design of products and services level and um, requires governments to put in policies that support those kinds of um, collaborative changes because the, actually the circular economy is really about collaboration. You can't have one company just doing it in isolation because mm. often it's the outputs of one company that become the inputs for another. And we need, so for example, if you're a food services industry um, company, then you need other companies to do things like the collection and washing of the reusable containers so that you can then provide that service. And this is happening. Like I have a lot of examples, especially from Europe, where this is already playing out, where we're seeing really transformative changes and we're seeing companies really thrive in this new landscape. Mm. Gosh, she shared um, so many things that, that are genuinely exciting, uh, particularly in relation to law and policy, because I had no idea that that was starting to come into play. To bring the question back to leadership for a minute, you know, you've just shared uh, all of this in incredible information with regards to 
how how this overlay is is you know coming into our social systems so for leaders who want to stay ahead of the game they really need to start embracing circular thinking in terms of the economic opportunity so what's your advice for leaders to really leverage this space in between these two paradigms and to to really be able to to thrive in uh as we move into this new era yeah i would say i mean one can always question what is a leader. You know, I think anyone yeah. has the ability to set the tone that creates or magnetizes people to yeah. a new outcome, right? So leaders in life. Yeah. Leaders are not just people who are sanctioned that, uh, you know, they're elected into it or that they're, they're, you know, um, hired for it. You know, we can mm. all lead in one way or another. Um, so, and that's the concept of agency and the ability for each of us to identify the power and influence that we have in the world around us. So I would say first and foremost, if you're listening to this and you're like, you have leadership, you know, branded on you, as I would say I do because of the role that I play in the world. But those of you who are listening, who are like, mm, not quite there yet. I think you have to consider leadership as really just being about how you live in the world mm. um, and the likelihood of your choices affecting other people in positive ways. Um, and so for me, the concept of leadership, though, in relation to sustainability and circularity, is there is a huge knowledge gap. So there's this core competency and basic understanding that most leaders do lack today. And that's really a lot of my work going into companies and supporting that transformation. And that's not the fault of anybody. I think the education system has done an appalling job at, 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 at in integrating this, especially mm -hmm. with regards to like MBAs. Like you go to study to literally get a job as a leader and you don't even learn what ESG is, which is environmental social governance, which mm -hmm. is the kind of metric of reporting. You don't learn about the circular economy. And if you did, I am tell me hit me up on on social media because i've worked with so many mba programs that are just not there yet at integrating this into their learning system so it does require individual learning it does require companies to be investing in um on in company skills training so that everybody understands the basics of what this is so what are the what is the greenhouse gas protocol and what is a scope three emission because i can guarantee you within the next three to five years every company will have to be reporting on their scope three emissions which are their entire supply chain what is a digital product passport? That is what the European Union is putting into place with regards to nearly every product category, which will require lifecycle data. What is lifecycle assessment? That is a scientific process of understanding the whole of life environmental impacts of a product system or service that can be done both streamlined, you know, like these are the knowledge. And it's, yeah. once you learn it, it's actually not that complicated. It's just that that we don't live in a world that prioritizes this information yet. And so therefore it's not part of say the onboarding of of um, an employee coming into a company i mean some pioneering companies absolutely are doing that like microsoft but a lot of um certainly smes and and larger companies in markets that haven't really adapted to this yet we've got a massive knowledge gap so the first thing is to find right information because again if you go to google and you just type in this stuff you're going to get a lot of um marketing material mm. you know greenwashing is becoming more and more um, called out and there's laws around the world that are preventing companies from making claims that they can't back up scientifically, which is the antidote to greenwashing. Um, but at the same time, there is still a lot of people who gain um, benefit from communicating certain things that are maybe not the most appropriate and correct. So find your sources. I mean, the United Nations definitely has a lot of resources on this. You can start with the sustainable development goals. You can go to the global compact. You can look up the greenhouse gas protocol. As I did mention, I have a lot of courses on this stuff, both through the unschool and through swivel skills. But yeah, I, I mean, like I said, I literally did your course yesterday morning. Like you can put away just a few hours to get a fairly, a very succinct overview of all of the themes that you're talking about. Yeah. And I also write like I've written on Medium about a lot of this stuff freely, like my mm. goal. And also we have a lot of free resources. We have a whole circular redesign toolkit you can download for free and use today. We've had thousands of people use that in their lunchtime sessions with their colleagues just to get a sense of what the circular economy is and how it could apply to their workplace. You know, my goal is to make massive change and I want to see as many people as possible engage with this. And especially if you're listening and thinking, oh, this is not really, it doesn't really apply to me. Actually, it probably applies to you even more <laughs> because- the kinds of changes that we need are in how we um, deliver value into the economy. So if you're in sales or marketing, if you're in communications, this is so important because this is about value shifts. 
It's about changing mm. what we value because right now we do value convenience and disposability and that is inherently unsustainable. And so the transformation is about valuing things that last longer, valuing things that have designed better. And that does require all members of society to think differently about how we do get our needs met and what we are willing to spend our hard-earned money on. Um, so yeah, I think at the end of the day, leadership is really about learning. Uh, it is about being open to the fact that you will never know everything, but you will certainly be very good at things and that you can always be better at other things. And that's certainly the case with sustainability and circularity is that it, it will only strengthen your skill set. And it's certainly a language that you're going to need to have moving into the future. Mm. So Leila, I, I want to pick up on one tool because for those listening, if you walk away with just one tool from this conversation, that's going to make a difference. And one of the things that I thought was was brilliant was a really simple idea. You've already mentioned it was the life cycle assessment mm -hmm. because it's something that we can apply in our personal lives and something that we can apply across the board in terms of how we how we run our business so I'm wondering if you could explain what the life cycle assessment and life cycle mapping is all about yeah so life cycle assessment or LCA is a scientific process that's governed by an ISO standard international standard organization 14,000 mm -hmm. series so it's been around for about 30 years and essentially it's a, it is literally a scientific uh, assessment that requires a lot of complex data that then goes through a system of assessing the, the product um, and ha across five main life cycle stages, extraction of raw materials, manufacturing, packaging and transportation, use and end of life. And across these stages, there's multiple points that this product that's being created will intersect with the natural world. And based on, like I said, this kind of complex assessment process, we're looking at all of the different impacts that could occur. Now, LCA is used by companies to that, to either um, get a, a snapshot of their current design choices and then change them or to validate environmentally preferable products and services. According to the ISO standard, any LCA done has to be done in relation to the, the standard, but also it needs to be peer reviewed before it can be published. So that does make it costly and time consuming. So that's the process of life cycle assessment. It's very useful. It's very important if you are trying to make green claims and it will feed into new policies that are being developed in the European Union. But then there's the quick and dirty version called life cycle thinking, which is something I've been a proponent of for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. It's essentially the same idea that an LCA practitioner would use, but without all the complex data, you're doing essentially a map of what's going on in a product's life. And you, you basically go through those five main life cycle stages, starting with your materials. So if you take any product, and I do this in workshops with a pen, because it's hilarious how complicated pens are, you basically map all the materials that exist in, in the product. And then you go back one stage to like, where did these materials come from in nature? And what natural systems were disrupted in order to get those materials? And then you move forward based on its design, the materials, how they're made, how they're put together, you'll get information about the use and the end of life. And that use phase will determine how long it's used for based on how durable it is. And the end of life will be how likely it is to be recycled, re, um, ended up in landfill or perhaps escaping into nature, which is quite common. And so there's also packaging and transportation, which sits in the middle because it happens across the full life of the product. So in life cycle thinking and life cycle mapping, we're, we're basically spending 20 minutes getting this snapshot. And in this case, Google is your friend because a lot of this information can be quickly discovered from company websites and, and a little bit of quick data searching. And that gives us an idea about what's going on. And then we can make comparable decisions between um, materials processes, or we can also optimize the design of the product. And so in my approach to circular um, design, we use um, life cycle thinking as the core process of understanding the current linear model. And then we go about redesigning that with the circular approaches on top of it. And again, that that circular redesign toolkit you can get from Unschools or Swivel Skills is free. And that shows you how to go through this whole process. It, it literally um, steps you through it. And um, the thing about this is that when you use life cycle thinking, absolutely 100%, I guarantee you, like, you know, all your money back, your mind will be blown a little bit because I've literally taught it to like tens of thousands of people. <laughs> and every time people are like, oh my God, I had no idea this was so complicated. And it really helps you get this perspective on what it takes to make something. It basically exposes the hidden life of the things around us. And even companies who literally design these products, they do it and they're like, we had no idea. So mm. it's a really powerful tool. And then if you want the next stage from like doing a life cycle map 
would be looking at LCAs that are published in the field that you're working in, the product category. Um, and that's if you go to Google Scholar, which is a special part of Google that houses only peer reviewed academic um, published data. You can look for LCAs on particular materials or products. And, and it's likely there will be there because it's a very robust scientific field that's been around for a long time. And you can then kind of get a snapshot of, of what the data is saying from other studies. And you can use that to inform your decision. Mm -hmm. Now, chances are, if, if you are doing a life cycle map, one of the things you're going to uncover is the amount of waste that is left over. And, you know, arguably waste is, is the biggest challenge that we face um, with, you know, the elimination of 2 billion tonnes of waste that we produce every single year. Much of, as as you've already said, much of which that comes just in from- just Australia or globally? 2 billion? That, that was globally, I believe. This is from my homework yesterday. Maybe I've jotted no, my notes down I think incorrectly. It's a lot more. I mean, we 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 produce a significant amount of waste, and only twenty percent of all waste ever produced is recycled, and only nine percent of plastics is recycled. So, like, we are we are very much in a in a in a waste fueled economy. So, I don't know. I'd be interested to know what that is. Look, I, I might have incorrectly jotted down my stats in my fact finding yesterday. So, I would trust your your stat, stats more than mine on this particular subject. But it's a lot of waste. Um, you know, and as you've said, much of it comes from disposable products such as like toilet paper or chopsticks or or coffee cups. So I'm really curious to know uh, why you believe that the waste problem is in solving it is the the holy grail of sustainability. Okay, well, first of all, waste is just a misplaced resource. Yeah. Right. It's that we have devalued something because in nature, there is literally no such thing as waste. When something dies, its constituent parts become the fuel to create something new. So in nature, there's actually no such thing as death, which is a really kind of metaphysical thing to think about. But ultimately, everything is cycled around and around, and it is essentially a life giving resource. There is no um, elements of the system that are not somehow fitting into a beautiful kind of complex puzzle that supports the, the, the system sustaining itself. Whereas humans have created waste which is just shit we bury in holes in the ground or burn it's crazy and it's like if you would ever hung out at a landfill site which I'm almost certain you haven't you would be like oh my gosh what the fuck are we doing it's yeah. so crazy and the way we deal with waste is so dumb as well like literally they like compact it into squares and then they stack it up in holes in the ground often old mine sites and then every day they have to put soil on top of it to repress like the odors and birds and gulls. And if you think about it, like this is like nappies and apple cores and like batteries and all this shit. And it's just leaching toxic mm. crap. Ugh. And then you've got methane emissions, which are 25 to 38 times, sorry, 85 times more potent than greenhouse gas. Like it's just so dumb. And then at the end of the landfill's life, they'll cap it and they'll make a greenfield site. And yeah, I don't know. Like we just, it's so archaic the way we deal with it. And in Northern Europe, they actually don't really do landfills anymore. They do incineration, which has its own complex problems because obviously you're getting energy, but then, you know, you're losing those materials forever. At least like some really kind of weird concept of landfill is we can go back and mine landfill and get out the valuable materials that, you know, from the past. And there's like thousands of landfill sites that were built in, say, like the 1940s in sand dunes. Like where they just would like at, at resort coastal towns, they just like dig a hole in the sand and dump all their stuff and then cover it up. And then what do you think happens to sand? <laughs> in a row. <laughs> so now we have all these historic, like crappy landfills, like just washing trash out into the ocean. Like, I'm laughing yeah. because it's just so ridiculous, right? So we basically have this, just it's when you really look at it, you think, God, what a dumb idea. Like this, we really could do better. We really could. Like we can go, we can go to space, <laughs> which actually space junk is a whole other issue. There's literally millions of pieces of yeah. junk orbiting earth from all the space missions. That's a whole other conversation. Anywho. So the point is, is that we have just basically made a system of like, like when you were a kid and you were asked to clean your room and you just shoved everything under the bed, which was my classic tactic. Um, <laughs> that is like what humanity's done. We're like, put it in a bin, put it on the street, forget about it. Magically, it'll disappear. And recycling is no better because recycling, unfortunately, validates the production of waste. So whilst recycling is part of the circular economy, it is a very low level solution. We actually 
don't want to rely on recycling because recycling is um, a system that reinforces the fact that disposability is part of the system. And as I already stated, we're not anywhere near the rate of recapture and recycling that would make it a valuable solution to the problems that we face. So we we will have it always, but it's definitely not the thing that we should be focusing on at all. Um, and so Basically, in my mind, waste is essentially a lost resource that we need to figure out how to uh, utilize better. I think we can definitely learn from nature here where everything can be broken down and reconfigured in different ways. But also we have the option to design products and services that last longer, that are reusable, um, as was already mentioned. And so, yeah, I mean, I have this dream of a post-disposable future. Like, what does it look like where we don't literally have trash cans in our lives anymore? And to be fair, 70 to 100 years ago that was how it was like yes you mm. had like rubble from building and you had soles from shoes and things like that but nearly every material that was used before the plastics revolution was naturally digestible by nature in some way I mean glass takes a really long time um but it is but in the sense that We've created these incompatible systems now and our technology is a massive issue as well. You know, just to put it in perspective, we have, we've entered into, according to geologists, this period called the Anthropocene, anthro meaning human. So the age yeah. of I interviewed I, Gaia Vince actually who okay. wrote a book on this exact subject. Yeah. Right. And so the crazy thing about this is the way the geologists are determining when we entered into the Anthropocene, which the kind of common consensus, which is not confirmed yet, is around 1950, is by doing these soil samples of like taking core samples of like ice and soil and rock and trees. And there's this like layer that is evident all over the world, which is this layer of soot aluminium, persistent chemicals, nuclear isotopes. And these are all things that have been man-made that are not absorbed back into nature in the, 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 like, of course they would eventually over a very long period of time, but they kind of show this, this really significant shift, which was around 1950. And so, you know, we're living in an era of human dominance on the planet to our own detriment. And for me, that shows a huge opportunity. If we designed ourselves into this mess, then we can definitely design ourselves out. And that's the challenge in front of us. And waste is an opportunity to create, uh, I, I'm not going to say better, but create products and services and things that meet our needs, but in much more elegant ways. And, and right now, it's so clumsy what we do. Mm. And you know, it's also shitty because companies design products that are wasteful, whether it be the physical product itself or whether it be the packaging. And you and I pay for that de bad decision because we all pay for rates when we live in a house that the council, a large percentage of those rate money is picking up your trash and finding places for it. So we pay for bad design and we don't realize it. And we also pay for it in, you know, the bigger sense of like the environmental and social impacts mm. that those waste systems have. So, you know, it's inherently inequitable in my opinion. And, and the circular economy and dealing with waste is actually not just an environmental, but it's an equity issue because when we have products that are designed to break, which most products are, you have people who are locked into continual consumption cycles and they're forced to continue buying products because they can only afford to buy the cheap product that's yeah. intentionally engineered to break after a period of time so that they're forced to buy new products over and over again. And if you're already suffering financially, that's forcing you into this kind of like system of inequity. And, and mm. whereas people who are wealthier can afford to perhaps pay a significant amount up front for a product that's going to last longer. Um, you know, so it's it, there's so many equity issues that can be resolved. Waste is also something that is trafficked and it is processed in very substandard ways in communities where there are lax environmental laws and there are communities who are desperate for income. So you have Thailand fishing communities that are getting e-waste dumped mm -hmm. and they are processing in these extremely unsafe ways for their own health and the environment, not because they're bad people, but because the system allows and encourages that. So, you know, it's, we are, it, the, 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 the issue with waste is that somebody has to be, um, Somebody has to stay in poverty in order for waste to be to exist. It's a really inequitable system. And those of us in Western countries have a lot to answer for in our consumption choices and also um, in the, the design of the products that are ultimately fueling the consumerism in the Western world. Mm. Leila, you mentioned uh, technology before. Um, and we you know we're clearly in an age of exponential progress, which uh, undeniably has risks 
associated with it and also implications in relation to to the environment and what we're talking about today. But there are also huge opportunities here in terms of empowering sustainability. So I'm really curious to understand what, in your view, we should be concerned about, but also what opportunities are available to us uh, in reflection of like AI and automation and, and other technologies that can support us in this journey? Okay. Knew there was going to be an AI question. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. We have landed. Oh, AI. Oh, I don't know. I have such mixed feelings about it. Um, I recently did like the the chat GBT Scarlett Johansson version where I asked her to be me and it was really creepy because she was kind of good but then really bad <laughs> so, <laughs> you're like, mm. I was like I can do much better than this Scarlett thank you very much but I'm like she's just going to get better <laughs> the better I get the better she's going to get it's super weird um but I do definitely think that AI offers an amazing opportunity as far as efficiency goes we can mm. we can optimize a lot of our systems that are currently wasteful however at the same time everything we do digitally has a has a physical footprint on the planet because of the servers and the energy and the carbon emissions right so you know even this video call and, and you re-watching re or re-listening to it all of those yeah actions on the internet have physical impacts. And so we know that the rise in information technology sector and the internet of things is gonna just put even more pressure on a climate um, ravaged world, unless we change the way we um, we code. So like green coding is a huge thing where we're designing lighter weight code. And there's a really amazing example between um, Bitcoin and Ethereum where like the the, uh, carbon emissions associated with mining these coins is huge. Um, whereas in about a year and a half ago, Ethereum changed the, the process of mining and they reduced its carbon emissions by 97%. Which is huge. It's insane, right? Huge. Like, yeah. And that's because of the way in which the structure or the system was designed and the system around it. And, you know, any website or any um, digital interface can be designed differently. Um, and, you know, I mean, there's a whole bunch of different things in this space. Like mm. I even will admit my websites are terrible. They've got like huge carbon loads because th the service providers that we use, they don't buy green energy or green mm. service, right? So you kind of have- It's an important conversation though, because I think a lot of us think, oh, well, you know, I'm going to start a digital business because it's more sustainable without actually understanding the full spectrum of the carbon impact. Everything we do has an impact. Everything. Yeah. Nothing is a, a devoid of impact. It's- a combination, it's, we call it trade-offs. Like what is the outcome of the, of the action? And is the outcome more beneficial than the loss from the system? Mm. So like packaging, for example, packaging that protects a product and if to a certain degree and reduces waste is actually in many cases, like a kind of necessary evil because we are able to protect the product if the product, excuse me, is of high value. So you kind of have this like trade-off that you have to make. I mean, we live in an imperfect system and in the process of the transformation, there's going to be a lot of these trade-off decisions that have to, to be made as we kind of tighten up the solutions. So yeah, we have, certainly there's like more um, greener servers and there's like servers in Sweden that the heat generated from them is used to heat houses and stuff. So there's all these kind of co-design processes that are happening or co um, uh, you know, it's called industrial symbiosis where you've got different companies using waste resources to support the inputs of others. Um, but so I think though, aside from all of that, that the impact of technology um, and the fact that most tech that's physical tech, whether it be the computer that we're speaking on or, you know, any of the new fandangle, you know, tech talk to devices that fill our lives, um, they all require very complex minerals and metals, many of them conflict minerals and metals that are extracted from lands that you will probably never go to and you will probably never witness the tragedy of the um, conditions of which the people who are extracting those minerals and metals go through. So, you know, it's there is a lot of equity issues in the supply chain around mm -hmm. our technology as well. And then not to mention the fact that most technology is designed to not be repaired, but there's a massive repair movement and France actually has new repair laws that are really um, transforming the industry. So I think we'll see repair become one of the major um, factors in the next few years. So aside from all of that, I think technology offers a huge opportunity. Um, one of the big things of the circular economy is that we have to manage assets. So I actually do think a lot of um, the kinds of solutions that put it, get put into play will involve some sort of digital interface because it's about 
knowing where things are so that whoever owns them are able to track them and 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 keep them and if you are then buying into a service of having things delivered in reusable packaging for example that's all going to need a tech interface and so i actually think there's a huge uh, opportunity in what i call circular service design service design is the type of design that um, understands the uh, experience that a customer has in engaging with the business. And there's a lot of opportunity to redesign that service so that it is uh, circular and, and really frictionless, we call in design, where you don't actually notice it because most design done well, you won't notice. Uh, it's only poor design that you'll notice and you'll be frustrated by it. So there's a big opportunity and I am excited by it as well as a little um, petrified. And I think a lot of people make decisions that have unintended consequences about their digital choices um, and that, you know, there's an opportunity for us to really improve the efficiency and impact of those decisions. So I've come to my last question today. What I'm, what I'm curious to know is if there is anything that you feel is super important that you haven't already shared that would be valuable for our audience to hear? Hmm. I mean, I feel we covered a lot of ground. We covered a lot of ground. <laughs> it was a sprint. <laughs> yeah, I would say like generally, so in my experience, I work with lots of different people and I think that there's, um, there is a little bit of um, an agency crisis and what I, I don't mean like design agency. I mean, like agency is the concept in, in sociology and psychology of like how you see the role that you can play in the world mm. and your ability to advocate for yourself or your ideas. Um, but also just in sense of like a lot of the kind of cycles of consumption and waste are kind of built into a, the psychology of status and, and perhaps self-esteem. And, you know, there's a lot of things at play when it comes to why we buy stuff and why we also perhaps don't value the things that are in our lives. And so I would challenge everyone listening to think about, you know, where they can, you know, challenge their own understanding of their choices and why and how they might not be engaging with this. Or if you're really passionate about it and you're already engaging with it, don't beat yourself up because that's the other thing. Like there's just so much mm. shame and guilt that exists in this space. This is a process of transformation, which requires testing and experimenting. And sometimes we're going to make decisions that are not going to end up being great. And sometimes we have to accept that our choices will have impacts and that we will then mitigate those impacts in other areas of our lives or decisions. And that it's those nuances that are really important. So agency is really about understanding that each of us has the power and influence to affect the world around us and the choices that we make have impacts and we need to be more informed about those choices and also be a bit open to the outcome not always being what we expect, but to learn from it. And I think that's a lesson in life as much as it is in, in helping to change the world for the better. As you mentioned, we have covered a lot today, but as I said, having having uh, had a really good look at the work you have available online, the content, the tools, the templates. There is You have offered uh, and built a platform that really will support people to go on this journey. Where can we learn more about your work or get access to the resources that you have available? Yeah, so unschools.co, you can take up to 100 courses, short courses. Um, you can download lots of free resources. And then we also have Swivel Skills, which is the at scale corporate sustainability training platform. You can take individual classes. We have a whole course in circular economy leadership, for example. Um, and then we, but the idea with that is that companies pay for people to go through the program and then they actually can apply it in their workplace. And then we also have, um, I also have uh, my own website, leilaradaralu.com, where you can read all my Medium articles where I write extensively about systems thinking, life cycle thinking, many of the topics we talked about. And follow me on LinkedIn. I have three LinkedIn learning courses that if you're a subscriber to LinkedIn, you can watch for free. Or I very uh, readily, and that's probably what you saw yesterday, post them and you can watch them for free for 24 hours. Yep. If you post them. So if you follow me on LinkedIn, then you'll get access to that and any of the other things I write about. So it's yeah, I linked through from your website, actually. Oh, really? And you could yeah. watch, are you, could you watch I it? Went, I did the whole course. <laughs> Good. Yeah, no, I, I'm all for it. I <laughs> like I don't, I, you know, it's, I'm not the owner of LinkedIn, so yeah. <laughs> but I do LinkedIn actually, I'm really, I've really enjoyed working with the platform and, and actually the LinkedIn learning courses I found to be extremely fun. If you do watch them, you will see, I'm a little obsessed with props. Um, especially my first one, which is sustainability is an innovation opportunity, which we filmed during COVID. And I have to say, like, I really pulled out all the stops with the random props that we just found. Lying around, so. I'll have to check that one out. <laughs> 
Yeah. But like I said before, you really simplify complexity and really break down a vast amount of information into tangible action steps. Um, and I think that is that is one of your gifts in Thank the world you. is the ability to really act as a translator for the planet and well, to show us the way into this new paradigm. So I am not only grateful to have you on the podcast today, I am grateful that we have you uh, leading us, showing us at this exact point in human history. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for joining me on the DNA of Purpose podcast, Dr. Layla Ajaralu.